welcome to an adventure. Hopefully you can see me and hear me. Uh, and hopefully you're having a great Wednesday. Um, uh, today is uh, Wednesday of homecoming week here at Virginia Tech. I'm quite quiet compared to the music. All right. Um, have to just step away from camera for just a moment. Um, you'll still be able to hear me, but I have to go over to the soundboard. Um, do, 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 do. Let's see. If I bump the main a little bit, uh, I'm hoping this is better. If this is too loud, tell me. <laughs> but uh, hopefully that has improved the audio balance between me and the music? Somebody let me know. <laughs> but hi, Hannah. Uh, hi, Wannabe Sayuri. Hi, Shadows of Life. Much better. Good. OK. Um, and uh, Hannah and Wannabe Sayuri, thank you both very much for the resubscriptions. Um, 20 months and 16 months. It's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to have you here, especially for the archives stream, which is such a weird thing to do on a Twitch channel, but also just seems to work. Um, sorry, I have a cord that is in a weird position. Uh, anyway, anyway. Uh, I lost my place. <laughs> We're at the start of stream. Uh, welcome to an adventure. <laughs> uh, welcome to Archival Adventures. Uh, I am Anthony Wright de Hernandez Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech, and this is my once a week stream where I share things from the past. Um, whether it is old comic books, uh, reading, reading people's mail, um, looking at photos, you know, whatever we happen to find in an archival box down in Special Collections, um, I'll share it here on stream. So <laughs> that's, that's a tall order. Uh, but you love the archive streams? I'm glad that you like them. Um, <laughs> hi, Lord Portico. Welcome in. Uh, I think I had things that I was going to mention. Oh, yeah. Um, it's, it's homecoming week here at Virginia Tech. If you happen to be local to the area, if you happen to be in southwest Virginia uh, around 4 PM tomorrow, <laughs> here on the second floor of Newman Library, there is an opening launch event thingy reception at 4 <laughs> for um, the Celebrating Virginia Tech uh, 150 Years of History exhibit that is on display on the second floor here, as well as a um, launch event for uh, No Ordinary Moment, 150 Years in 150 Images, um, the book that um, uh, was put out by Virginia Tech Publishing this year uh, that I helped to write. Um, so I'll be there for that event, uh, signing books. If anybody stops by and buys one and wants signatures, all four of the authors will be there and will be signing. Um, but yeah, that's from four to five tomorrow on the second floor of Newman Library, um, if you happen to be in the area. So, uh, so yeah. Um, <laughs> puts open launch thingy reception, yes. <laughs> Um, uh, it's weird that I'm part of an event that I didn't, like, do the management of the planning thereof. I've done parts of the planning, but it has been, like, third on my list of things. 
So um, I know it's happening. I know it's on the second floor. I know it's tomorrow from four to five. Um, and that it's focused on the sesquicentennial exhibit and book, uh, both of which I worked on. Um, so yeah, I will not be speaking. I'll just be signing. Uh, <laughs> anyway, let me actually get us started sort of the way that we typically do. Um, and that would be by reading out the land acknowledgement and labor recognition. Um, since we have gone too long already without it. Um, and let me see, I think I have the, woo, Hannah, thank you very much. Uh, I had the command copied and I just needed to paste it, but you beat me to it. Um, land acknowledgement and labor recognition. This is the official statement from uh, Virginia Tech. Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tutelo and Monacan people's homeland and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that legislation and practices like the Morrill Act of 1862 uh, enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of Native nations from their lands, both locally and in Western territories. We understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tutelo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. We must also recognize that enslaved black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and were prohibited from attending until 1953. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to a prosim that I may serve, in the spirit of community diversity and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. And Hannah found the book link. Um, and yeah, that's actually a useful book link. That link, uh, <laughs> that one goes to the University of Virginia Press who actually published the book, which admitting that here on the uh, Virginia Tech University Library's Twitch channel um, may put me in danger. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> there's a rivalry between Virginia Tech and University of Virginia that I believe has something to do with sports and goes back a long ways. Um, and so the fact that our book about the sesquicentennial was actually published, like printed, it was published, edited and, and whatever by Virginia Tech Publishing, but the people who actually arranged the printing of it uh, were the University of Virginia Press. Um, uh, it didn't, uh, oh yeah, Hannah, that's because um, that channel doesn't like links. Uh, let me, one second. All right, you should be able to drop the link now, Hannah. Thank you. Um, apparently not. Well, then, one moment. Uh, I was not prepared. It's showing in the channel chat for you as working. It still showed me the three stars. Strange. Uh, we'll just uh, throw it in there myself. Uh, and there, now I know for sure it's there. But thank you very much for the assistance, Hannah. Um, we do not have a, a we just have, um, we have VT Publishing, but primarily what they have done in the past is um, works that were published in sort of an ebook form and were available to order uh, for like 
individual like uh, have it printed on demand type orders. Um, this is the first book that BT Publishing has done with the intent that it would be uh, wide distribution, fully published uh, print book with a mix of color and, uh, and regular black and white text and glossy pages and like it, it's the first like that had that intent. So, um, the, and the place that was able to do the best as far as a deal and, and whatnot uh, for actually getting it physically printed um, for us was, was the press over at University of Virginia. Um, anyway, the, uh, <laughs> that's enough about the book. <laughs> but yes, uh, it exists if you're interested in Virginia Tech history. Um, there is a book of primarily images. It's sort of a coffee table book about um, the history of Virginia Tech, the 150 years. Um, we tried to focus on including images that were less well known, not seen in every publication, um, as well as trying to make sure that we paid attention to all of Virginia Tech history, regardless of whether it was super positive or not. Um, so there are things in there that are great. A lot of it's great, uh, but there are also things in there that show some of the, the strain, um, such as uh, <clears throat> a few years back, there was a, a, wow, my brain isn't gonna remember exactly, but there was a student response poster that had asked the question, why do, why do Black Lives Matter at Virginia Tech? And um, one of the images in the book is that poster with all of the responses that had been written on it. The words, uh, why do, uh, crossed out. So it just read, do Black Lives Matter at Virginia Tech? And um, prominently beneath that is hell nah. Uh, so <clears throat> that's part of that book of Virginia Tech history. And I think it belongs there. So uh, anyway, the, the collection we're looking at today is not focused on Virginia Tech. <laughs> the collection that we're focused on today is the Glass Lantern Slide Collection. Um, and there we go with the finding aid <clears throat> item, which I'm gonna... Boom, okay. So if you wanna check out the finding aid, which is um, displayed on the screen right now, it won't be there forever. And uh, that link in chat will take you there. Um, but yes, this week's destination, Europe. Uh, 17th century technology. We're looking at the glass lantern slide collection. Um, it caught my attention just mostly because of the name. And uh, so this collection consists of a, slet of a set of glass lantern slides of architectural buildings and elements from around the world, especially Britain, France, uh, Germany, Greece, Italy, Lebanon, Spain, and a number of ancient civilizations, including um, the Etruscans, the Romans, the Egyptians, and the Persians. Uh, also includes a set of lantern slides that were simply labeled Gaudé. Uh, followed by a number. So um, we'll take a look and we'll see what we can figure out from uh, the slides themselves. Um, two boxes. So the first box is Britain through Italy in alphabetical order and the second box, Italy through Spain, but also including the, uh, the Gaudet numbered slides that apparently uh, we're unclear as to what they are. Uh, in looking at this collection, I was like, well, okay, so what's a glass lantern? Well, it's not a, it's, it's glass lantern slides. Um, cool topic, you're mostly looking. Hey, key squared lurks are absolutely accepted. 
Also, hi, Shadows. I don't remember if I said hi to everybody in chat. Um, uh, and if I missed anybody, I'm sorry, but you are welcome. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, so I did want to pull up this site uh, just to get a little bit of information. I do not have the lantern that these slides were designed to fit inside, but I thought it'd be good before we look at the slides to know a little bit about the technology that they were built for, uh, which is known as a magic lantern. And so this site that I found, magiclanternsociety.org, um, has this about page. I'm gonna actually make it slightly larger. Uh, all right, about magic lanterns. The magic lantern was invented in the 1600s, so 17th century technology, uh, probable, probably by Christian Huygens, uh, a Dutch scientist. Um, uh, some of the research, because I was curious, uh, it seems that quite possibly it may also have been invented in Germany. Um, it emerged sort of from uh, the Netherlands and Germany around the same period of time. If you go to the Wikipedia article, there's uh, a list of other possible sources, but it's generally believed to have been uh, Huygens who invented it. Think Fantasy Green Lantern. Uh, it was the earliest form of slide projector and has a long and fascinating history. The first magic lanterns were illuminated by candles, but as technology evolved, they were lit by increasingly powerful means. Um, uh, the name magic lantern uh, comes from the experience of the early audiences who saw devils and angels mysteriously appear on the wall as if by magic. I don't know. My little controller. Uh, refreshed and lost everything I was doing. So hopefully you can still see me. Because it's showing me no signal but I, I don't think it's actually no signal. I think we're good. <clears throat> anyway. Uh, devils and angels mysteriously appear on the wall as if by magic. Uh, even in the earliest period, performances contained images that move created with moving pieces of glass. As far as I'm aware, none of the slides in this collection have those moving pieces. Um, that would be really cool if we found some. I, I know these aren't the only uh, Magic Lantern slides that we have in the collection, um, like in our, all of our collections, but I have not really looked at the others. Uh, by the 18th century, the lantern was a common form of entertainment and education in Europe. The earliest known lantern show in the U.S. was in Salem, Massachusetts on December 3rd, 1743 for the entertainment of the curious. But the source of light for lanterns in that period, usually oil lamps, was still weak and as a consequence, the audiences were small. Uh, Mid-19th century, Two new forms of illumination, um, limelight, uh, which was heating a piece of limestone until it became incandescent. It was dangerous, but produced a light that was strong enough project, to project an image before thousands of people, leading to large shows by professional showmen. I'm not a professional, sh professional showman, especially not when it comes to um, showing off slides. Uh, so, <laughs> I mean, I may be a professional showman in some ways, but uh, I don't show slides all that, all that often, but we'll find out. Uh, kerosene lamps were not nearly as bright, but they were so safe they could be used by children, uh, <clears throat> leading to widespread use in churches, schools, fraternal societies, and in toy lanterns. Uh, by the turn of the 20th century, electric illumination was introduced, which spread the lantern even farther. So this is sort of like the precursor to 
um, the projection camera or, or sort of the precursor to what you would have um, uh, in like a movie theater. Yeah, Key Squared, uh, honestly, you're not wrong. It is like steampunk PowerPoint. <clears throat> Um, this was the precursor to, if you've ever seen um, like older movies or possibly you're old enough to have experienced them yourself, um, when uh, somebody would bring a, a slide carousel in and uh, so you had the projector with the little slide carousel and they'd click a button and there'd be this clacking noise as the carousel moved to the next slide and projected it up onto the screen. It's the precursor to that. It's also the precursor to um, the overhead projector, uh, basically all of those things, including like movie projectors for movie, studio, movie theaters and things like that. This is the technology that all of those evolved out of. <laughs> hi, hi, Philip. Yeah, steampunk PowerPoint. I, I like I like that definition. Uh, Philip's be <laughs> lanterns <laughs> became ubiquitous in American culture. Several hundred companies made their own brands, often in a bewildering array of different models. At the top end were the exotic tri uh, triunials and biunials, which were three and two lens lanterns used by professional showmen. At the bottom were inexpensive single lens lanterns, and the very popular children's lanterns were a favorite Christmas present. As yet, there is no published description covering all these different kinds of lanterns. Uh, so I'm not going to read their entire, well, I, I might as well read. I've read the entire thing except for one paragraph, so might as well finish. Uh, while the triunials and biunials can be expensive, a good working lantern big enough to handle the standard large format slides can be found on eBay uh, with careful searching for under $100 and a basic working children's lantern for under $50. Uh, thus, it's easy to begin a Magic Lantern collection and create shows using the slides that are also readily and inexpensively available on eBay. Just search for Magic Lantern. Uh, <laughs> losing frames while watching an RPG game of Steampunk Power... Streampunk PowerPoint. Oh, no. No, don't lose frames. Um, ironically, your university has an early 20th century lantern projector in the collection, but only one slide... We have lots of slides. We do not have, as far as I'm aware, any projectors. We have some old, like, um, if you remember viewfinders, the little, like, plastic toy that you'd stick a, a paper disc that had little, tiny, little uh, pieces of film in it. You'd stick it in there, and it had, like, a little clicky thing, and, and it, was, it was called a viewfinder. We have early forms of that physically here, um, but we don't have one of these. <laughs> um, so the Magic Lantern Society of the US and Canada is a group that collects, preserves, and shares information on the many devices. Uh, let's see, often called a stereo opticon show, Magic Lantern shows were the combination of projected, li projected images, live narration, and live music that preceded the movies. They were incredibly popular 100 years ago. Uh, by the 19th century, the Magic Lantern was used in theaters, churches, fraternal lodges, and at home by adults and children. In 1895, there were between 30,000 and 60,000 lantern showmen in the United States, giving between 75,000 and 150,000 performances a year. Uh, that means there would have been several shows a week. The classic Viewmaster slide viewer was created by an African-American designer, Charles Harrison. Key Squared, thank you for sharing that. I did not know that. Um, it is definitely a good memory from my youth, the uh, Viewfinder, or the Viewmaster. Um, all right, what do you say we take a look at some slides? And you can see how I've chosen to present them to you without the projector that they're meant to use. Uh, honestly, I don't think you'll be surprised. Come on, switch scenes. There we go. Um, so I, I'll give you a, a tiny little peek here at, um, I have the extra lighting turned off today. Uh, I usually have some document lighting that I'm not using today because today we're using the light box. 
Um, and just to show you, this is what one of the boxes in the collection looks like. Um, you can see. So a standard, uh, a standard Magic Lantern slide is four inches by three and a quarter inches. Um, and they are made of glass. Yes, light box plus baffle equals classic tech hack. This is not the first time I've done this. Uh, when we looked at the, um, the volumes, uh, when we did the American Woods show, uh, where I had the books that had paper thin slices of American trees, um, that you needed to be able to shine light through them to really get the, the effect of what that wood looked like, and the whole reason they were cut paper thin was so you could shine light through them. Um, I also did the same thing where I took a piece of paperboard and cut out um, a frame to block most of the light coming from the light box so that we would just see the um, The thing that we were looking at, the thing that we're actually lighting. Wow, my brain did not want to do that. I am putting on gloves for the slides because um, I just don't want to get like fingerprints all over them and stuff like that. I don't think that I would necessarily disturb them too much, uh, but I'm going to go ahead and turn on the light so the center of the screen is going to get kind of bright. You have a if, if it comes on. You have a slide protector somewhere in a bunch of slides thanks to cleaning out your grandpa's house. Yeah, you should definitely see if it works. Even if you don't want it, you could always, if it's functional, uh, you could sell it. Or possibly give it to an archives that wants one. <laughs> um, all right, so the first slide that I have is um, the envelope reads uh, Britain, uh, Cabshell House, C A B E S H I L L House. Um, I think it's Cabshell. I don't know. I've never heard of this place, but we have a slide here. Uh, oh, that. That's working. It's working well. Uh, we've got the light shining through. Um, it's picking it up on camera. My frame worked. Uh, so this is an interior image of a place called Capsule House. Um, I'm looking to see what else might be on the label here. Apparently this slide was made by J.P. Troy, a lantern slide maker at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. Um, British. I think it says British Room, Capsule House. 22C8A, I'm guessing, is like a control number for the slide. It is a very busy room. Um, I don't know specifically era. I would assume probably like Edwardian or Victorian. Uh, my guess would be Edwardian based on just decor, but I don't know for certain. Um, I'm going to look and see what we can learn about a place called Capsule House because I've never heard of it. And since we have it here, this may happen a bit. Oh, it's a uh, Colsal House, apparently. I swear, and and no, it, it is written on here as C-A-B-E-S-H-I-L-L. -L. Uh, and I can sort of understand why, but apparently the actual place in the world is Colsal House, C-O-L-E-S, H-I-L-L. -L. Google figured that out really fast. Um, 
It was a country house in England near the village of Colesall uh, in the Vale of White Horse. Historically, the house was in Berkshire, but since boundary changes in 1974, its site is in Oxfordshire. Uh, may have been designed by Inigo Jones and built for Sir Roger Pratt around 1660. Uh, Nicholas Pevsner described it as the best Jonesian mid 17th century house in England. It was gutted in 1952 and demolished in 1958. Uh, the Colesville estate is now owned by the National Trust. So uh, this photo is at least older than 1958. Well, older than 1952, because it was gutted by fire in 1952. Um, what I'm curious about is how well, how much detail are you all getting in the image? I'm going to, I'm going to zoom this up big because I want to see. It's washed out a tiny bit. I wish I had some onion skin with me. Because uh, I would love to, I just, I don't think I have any. I'm looking. <laughs> I have a few things with me. I just don't know if I have that. or like just some thin paper to sort of uh, mute the light just a tad. But I don't think, uh, so you're, you're mainly only losing a little bit of, of detail here. I'm curious if I shut off the light I think that's what we're going to do. We're going to show them both ways. Because I think you're getting a little bit more detail here unlit. I think it's worth showing them lit up. But because of the lighting that I currently have available, uh, you're losing a little bit of detail uh, when I shine the light through it. So Jonesian as in Inigo Jones. Um, Shadows, they, yeah, I believe yes. Or Key Squared was asking that. All right, so let's, unless people have specific things they want to say about that one, I'm going to move on. Um, it's an experiment. I know for next time, or I'm going to try and make a note for myself for next time, that I should... Uh, get some onion skin to wash out the, the light or maybe I need to have the slide further away from the light uh, in order to light it properly I don't know we'll, we'll I will experiment and figure it out but our next slide um, is Britain Castle Howard very flickery. There we go. And see, that one looks great lit up. It's not really washing out that much. But I am curious. If I lift it and bring it further from the light, does it get better? This is all experimentation. You have an actual onion, but putting it inside a projector doesn't seem to make it work better. I don't know why not, Key Squared. Uh, I was working with a lot of onion skin yesterday, so I, uh, I was messing with the sewage plant records, and they were almost all onion skin. Um, British Van Brugge Castle Howard High Renaissance. So these, um, I believe that this slide set 
most likely would have been a um, uh, something used by an architecture professor to sort of teach about architectural detail. Um, so noting that it is a, a Van Brugge and High Renaissance makes a lot of sense if that was the context. I don't believe we know because I don't think we actually know where we got this. Um, I'm just gonna check. Was found in a box when materials were being moved out of a location in, in the department in 2009. It's unknown where they came from, though their content suggests that they may have been teaching tools for a faculty member or a collection of images for research. There was a room. There was a whole room full of stuff that uh, had been acquired over the years. We don't have the documentation of like when we got it, why we got it, that type of stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, so we know we have it, but we don't know why or who acquired it or exactly when. Um, and the best that we could do as people working in the department uh, was to actually get it cleared out. Hi, Irene. I hope that you are uh, enjoying the chaos that this show is. It's great to have you back again this week. Um, uh, so, yeah, our... our people in our department back in 2009 were clearing away this, um, uh, clearing out, I, I have lost the sentence. They were clearing out a room that had a bunch of stuff in it that basically nobody knew what was in there. Um, stuff that had been acquired at some point in the past and nobody knew sort of what it was or why it was or any of that <clears throat> and for a lot of it they were not able to find documentation so the best they could do was just create the best documentation they could which was to say we found it in the room <laughs> and this was one of those collections uh, so here we have um, more Castle Howard but a specific like arch detail uh, I will try lifting. Uh, I made this whole frame. Next time I'll know, I need to build a frame that uh, doesn't sit directly on the light. Um, so, yeah, I'll know that for next time. Because I do, I do think having it further away is getting, is not washing out the detail the same. You can see the fireplace with all of the um, the uh, sculptures of human forms and the high archways. I could try zooming in. I don't know if it'll work. Um, I don't know how much detail is actually contained within the photograph. Uh, let me see how close we can zoom in and see if we can see some of the detail on these uh, sculptures. Ooh, look at that. Zooming in, that actually worked well. <laughs> some nice bust. <laughs> Oh, that's cool. Uh, you can see the the detail a little bit better there. Um, you actually, it doesn't wash out as much when it's zoomed in closer. That's really interesting. Um, I'm just, I'm amazed that I'm able to get these glass slides to show up on stream so well. Um, yeah, you can see there's, these are very, um, like Greco-Roman style sculptures. They're very like Mediterranean classical styled sculptures. 
Uh, and while these columns are square, the detailing on them is also um, classical styling, a Greco-Roman. I studied a little bit of architectural design as part of an art history class one semester. I am not an expert in this stuff. So if anybody does know and feels like expounding upon the things that we that we look at, or if anybody's been to Castle Howard and seen this in person, um, you are welcome to share. I actually don't think I need the gloves if I just don't touch the glass. Honestly, I don't think it's that big of a deal if I do, but um, they're wrapped in paper, so I don't think it's a huge issue. There you can see the neon lighting uh, from the light box um, and what it looks like on screen when you've got a neon light. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm actually going to zoom out one so that you can see the entire slide. It's a door. Uh, let's see, British? I don't know what it says there. R E A. L? R E A D? Oh, oh, I bet it's um, R E A D period, because it looks like it is a period there. I think it's British reading, is what that's short for, and it's referring to like these are the slides that go with the British reading assignment. Uh, that would be my guess. I don't know for certain, because again, we don't know what it is. Doors, Arch Enemy of DD &D Parties. Um, oh, yeah. And look at all the the detail around that door. It's, it's clearly uh, a magical spell, a magically locked door of some sort. Uh, <laughs> London, number 15. Uh... Ah, Buckingham Street. Uh, for some reason, I struggled to read that, but yeah, number 15, Buckingham Street, London. Or copied from the British Museum's reading room. Oh, the British Museum. The place full of all the stolen things. Yeah. I mean, wood paneling and a door. Uh, there's some, uh, you can see the crown moldings up top that are, are carved, sort of like a, a botanical motif up there. Um, all right, this has been some British things. I'm going to, This collection is difficult because I don't have like folder numbers on anything, so keeping it in the same order, much harder. Uh, but I have post-it notes that I'm just gonna be like, okay, this is the first, that's where I pulled the first ones out of because I don't wanna go in order. It belongs in a different museum. Um, you're not wrong, Shadows. Most of what's in the British Museum belongs in a museum in its home country. Uh, and I'm not afraid to say that. Uh, ooh, Egypt. Egypt, the Etruscans. Yeah. Let's pull this stuff out. It is all in alphabetical order, but alphabetical order for this many things takes a while to alphabetize. <laughs> um, all right, next up we have Egypt. Uh, Abu Simbel is what this says on the envelope. 
Ooh, this one's cracked. And appears to be upside down. <laughs> Let me just flip that over. I put it with the label at the same place and uh, it was upside down. So I thought I had cut this perfectly, but apparently I did not. Uh, it's just ever so slightly too small at one spot. It's fine, it doesn't matter that much. Um, oh wow, the crack, I can see the crack. I know where the crack is. I'm sure you all can see the crack too. Uh, oh, for reference, number 15 Buckingham is currently a brutalist office block. Well, that has certainly changed from what is in these slides. We don't know a date on these slides. We, like when the images from the slides were made, we don't know when the, they were compiled together because we don't know anything. Uh, we know they've existed since prior to 2009. Uh, we know the images in them, at least we could figure out a little of the images within them and, and like when the images would have had to have been taken so like we saw the the british one um with what was it the first place that we looked at the um colzel house that had to be from before 1952 uh because the house was gutted by fire in 52 and then um demolished in 58. so the image had to be from before that this slide is definitely from before 1968, indeed. But sometimes that is the best date you can put on something, and that is a more useful date than saying no date. Um, now, I don't know, Key Squared, if you were joking or if, thank you. You answered right as I was asking it. Um, I wasn't sure if you were joking or if it was because that something happened in 68 to the statues. Um, and you have confirmed uh, in 1968 they moved the statues due to flooding. I'm going to zoom in a little bit on this one because, um, actually I may just leave it at this zoom level. but. <clears throat> So that's as far as I can zoom in, but you can see the little, the, the statues here and the statues over here. Those are the things to look at in this image. Um, I'm just gonna use a pencil here. So right in here and right over here. And if you can see, there's a crack in the slide right along here and a crack in the slide right here as well. But they don't really affect the viewing of the image too much. If this had been like a film, um, creases or tears would be much more prominent than they are on this glass slide. A hydroelectric project. Yeah, I was not aware. Uh, but then again, I don't know. I didn't even know it was called Abu Zimbel. A historic site comprising two massive rock cut temples in the village of Abu Zimbel, um, Aswan governor, uh, Governorate, Upper Egypt, near the border with Sudan. Situated on the western bank of Lake Nasser, uh, it's part of the UNESCO World Heritage Site, World Heritage Site known as the Nubian Monuments. It was relocated in its entirety in 1968 as part of the international campaign to save monuments of Nubia under the supervision of a Polish archaeologist, Kazimierz uh, Michalowski, from the Polish Center of Mediterranean Archaeology, University of Warsaw on an artificial hill made from a domed structure high above the Aswan High Dam Reservoir. 
<clears throat> the relocation was necessary or they would have been submerged during the creation of Lake Nasser. The massive artificial water reservoir formed after the building of the Aswan High Dam on the River Nile. Cool. That's neat. Uh, this slide was, that slide was actually made by a different slide maker though. That's this one based in Chicago. Chicago. Um, El Lahun town map. These are kind of neat. <laughs> Which was the whole point. Like, if I had pulled them out and like looked at them and been like, "Yeah, these aren't very neat at all," I wouldn't. I wouldn't have shown them. Uh, I thought, "Hey, these are kind of neat." I'm actually going to see if pulling it forward makes the lines less prominent, like the spinning, no, the neon effect is just there. Anyway, this is a town map. Yes, yes, we're still in Egypt with this. Um, it, it says, Il Lahun or El Lahun town map. I am not familiar with this place and I don't know. Okay, so the, um, the chaos here, the ink chaos, that is not original to the slide. That is damage to the glass. Uh, I don't know for certain, um, but if I look at it at an angle, I can see that that portion of the glass um, has been altered compositionally uh, because it reflects light differently. So my assumption would be that at some point in the past, either some sort of chemical dripped on here that caused a reaction, or these spots on the glass got extra hot um, that caused the ink preserved in the glass to, uh, uh, basically the glass got liquid enough that it was able to, to move about. So I don't know exactly how the glass slides are made, whether the ink is um, embedded within or is printed on one side. If it's printed on one side, I could see possibly a chemical agent causing the issue. If the ink is embedded within, I would assume heat was the culprit here, but I don't know. If anybody does know uh, more about how these glass slides are manufactured and what would cause this sort of um, distortion, I would be interested. Uh, I do note that over here on the side it says Kahoon. So again, I think this is one where like the person processing it did their best but just did not get it labeled properly because um, they said El Lahun, but it is very clearly Kahun. Um, I don't know this place. Let's find out. Um. Oh no, wow. No, El Lahun. Which is also known as Kahun. So yeah, the, the processor did fine. A workman's village in uh, Fayum, Egypt, associated with the Pyramid of Senusret II, which is located near the modern town and is often called the Pyramid of Lahun. Huh. If it was heat, you think they're, Quite possibly shadows. I'm guessing, uh, let's see. Hmm. I, 
I'm going to see if I can learn a more up-to-date resource. Uh, key squared? I just looked in Wikipedia, honestly. Lantern slide plates were commercially manufactured by sensitizing a sheet of glass with a silver gelatin emulsion. Um, the plate was then exposed to a negative and processed, resulting in a positive transparent image with exceptional detail and a rich tonal range. Lantern slides were used for home entertainment and public lectures, and they were displayed in photographic exhibitions. So yeah, if it is, uh, silver emulsion on glass, then I'm guessing some sort of chem chemical agent got onto the slide and caused the distortion. Uh, lantern slide. Photographic emulsion bound to a gla glass plate and covered by another thin layer of glass. And then the plates are secured with strips of gummed paper tape. All right. In that case, so it, both sides are glass. The emulsion printing is on the inside, um, which explains why there's paper on the outside here of the, the slides. Um, that is paper tape that is meant to hold the two panes of glass together. Uh, but you all aren't going to be able to see it. No matter what I do, there's no way I don't think that I'm going to get this to show up on camera. Uh, you can see a little bit of it there. Do you see these sort of dark circles in the slide here? Those are... Um, Uh, those are mold on the inside of the two glass plates. That is some sort of, of mold or fungus. It looks like it's dead, but it those are very clearly like something has grown uh, inside between the, the glass plates. I don't know for sure that it's mold. It could be just bacterial colonies or something, but something got inside there and grew. Um, and then when you get over to the areas of the distortion, they're also infested, um, but it, yeah, I'm guessing it's just, it's extra shiny around the edges. Um, and so I'm guessing there was moisture involved there as well, like extra moisture. I'm not certain. I don't know. I would be curious to find out what. But it, they do appear to have been uh, sort of melted or otherwise dissolved I I into the chaos that they are now. But it's very clear there was some sort of um, like bacterial or mold growth in between the two slide plates, the two the two glass plates that make up the slide. Uh, so I'm, some silica, I, my guess would be some sort of humidity damage to this slide of the, the city map. It is, honestly, to me, that is really, really neat. Uh, I mean, from a, an archival standpoint, just like I get this is all sort of intended to be like architectural focus and like that's the whole point of why these slides exist as a collection in the first place is 
they're very clearly instructional slides to teach about architecture, but um, the condition of the slides is also super interesting to me. Uh, this one also appears to show a little bit of like water damage or like water residue. You can sort, you can even see it on on camera here. Um, there's dried water that has gotten on here, and you can see a little bit of that, um, the sort of rust color or dirt color uh, shapes here um, are the edges of some of the, the water. Um, so wherever this was stored before it came to the archives was exposed to water. Yeah, not useful for the in intended purpose, but really kind of cool and interesting to, to see sort of the, the damage that was caused by it being stored in uh, a humid or wet place. Um, So this, of course, is uh, at Giza. I say, of course, and then I have to look up uh, what the slide says it is. <laughs> um, oh, we have uh, next, next step after this uh, Giza one. I have a sketch plan of the tomb of Tutankhamun. These are kind of, oh wow, this one is red tape. It's very different. studying architecture. I don't have all the details. I, this is more just, oh, this, this all seems kind of cool. Let's take a look at it. But also, I enjoy just having some fun with the archives occasionally. <laughs> I'm sure most of this content you'd be able to find online pretty easily now. Tomb of Tutankhamun. Sketch of a plan of the tomb. But again, I don't know what year. And this one has actually sort of framing inside of it. So, If I turn off the light, you'll be able to see um, the slide itself. Oh, wow. Oh, maybe I should. I didn't even think to do that. Uh, but so this slide is different in composition. Um, we still have the label attached over on the side. Um, the tape on this one is red and plasticky instead of black paper tape. But inside, in between the two layers of glass, there is this, um, this ridged uh, plasticine or plastic material um, that defines a frame around the map. Uh, Portico, thank you. I will hydrate. And if it, like I said, if anybody is particularly interested in the subject of any of these things, feel free to expound upon it. Um, me, I'm, I'm, the, I'm most fascinated by the composition of the slides at the moment uh, that we have seen, which is why I keep focusing on the composition of the slides. But if you're intrigued by some other element, do tell. 
Um, let's see. Okay, so this was the one that had the the um, chaotic distortions, and I'm just curious. How, oh, yep, there we go. Uh, so with the backlighting, you all could see the, the circles of growth inside, but with taking away the backlighting, do you see the, the shiny bits, uh, the shiny sort of shape around where the distortion is? That it's sort of like crackling, or like if you took a, a gel base or a, a, a sort of a, if you took a piece of glass and you tapped lightly with a ball peen hammer until you got really fine cracks, that's what it reminds me of. I don't think though that it has been impacted. Um, this all seems to be water damage of some sort. Uh, so my guess would be water damage to the, um, uh, specifically damage to the inside um, silver gelatin layer that is the printing. Yeah, I need to remember that there, I have multiple different forms of lighting available and uh, that if we're trying to look at a detail, sometimes it will show up better one way versus the other. <laughs> one way or another. Sorry. Uh, this one just says Egypt on the envelope. The item, let's see. I'm trying to read the label, the handwriting on the label. D-E-I. The only thing I can make out is uh, that apparently this has something to do with Hatshepsut uh, because right along here it appears to indicate Hatshepsut, but um, I can't really make out anything else. Uh, <clears throat> but that would at least give me a clue to start from. We have a Hathor shrine over here. This is really kind of surreal looking at these because I've been rewatching Stargate, uh, the, S, the Stargate SG-1 TV series. Um, so, <laughs> Anubis and Hathor, yeah. <laughs> the, yeah, but just, I'm looking at Egyptian, the maps of Egyptian tombs and seeing um, things that ring in my head because of having watched uh, Stargate recently. Um, I don't see where, I don't see Anubis listed. Where, oh, Shrine of Anubis, gotcha. I saw the Shrine of, the Hathor Shrine. But yeah, Anubis and Hathor, uh, Well, now I'm going to look. I believe that, let's see, map. Why Hathor, though? Uh, well, we could try to explore that and find out. Um, yeah, okay, so this is the, uh, this is a map 
of the Mortuary Temple of Hatshepsut. It's located opposite the city of Luxor, considered to be a masterpiece of ancient architecture. Uh, The main axis, normally reserved for the mortuary complex, is occupied instead by the sanctuary of the Bark of Amun-Re, with the mortuary cult being displaced south to form the auxiliary axis with the solar cult complex in the north. Uh, separated from the main sanctuary are shrines to Hathor and Anubis, which lie on the middle terrace. I don't know why Hathor. Uh, Hathor was a major goddess in ancient Egyptian religion who played a wide variety of roles. Mother or consort of the sky god Horus and the, and the sun god Ra. Symbolic mother of their earthly representations. Uh, apparently she had some symbology uh, relating to being a form of protection from enemies. Hathor crossed boundaries between worlds, helping deceased souls in the transition to the afterlife. She, she is an afterlife goddess, yeah. You, you got there uh, right around the same time as I did, so... <laughs> left Egypt now with the next slide. Uh, I'm going to let you all tell me where we've gone. <laughs> I'm going to cover up part of it that might give it away. But, uh, but yeah, if you all want to tell me where we are now. I'm going to have to look this up myself because I don't know a whole lot. But uh, this is Etruscan because um, alphabetical order. The Etruscan civilization was devel developed by a people of Eturia in ancient Italy with a common language and culture who formed a federation of city-states. Uh, its ter territory covered at its greatest extent roughly what is now Tuscany, western Umbria, and northern Lazio, as well as what are now the Po Valley, Emilia Romagna, uh, Romagna Romana, nope, Roma I don't know, <laughs> Emilia Romagna, southeastern Lombardy, southern Veneto, and western Campania. Uh, so a lot of eastern and northern Italy. Um, this slide is interesting partly because it made me look up who the Etruscans were. It's a name of a civilization that I've heard many, many times and never knew where they were located. So thank you, Archival Adventures, for making me learn where the Etruscan people were located. But this slide is also interesting to me, again, because of composition. It's missing part of the glass. Um, so if I look here, I turn it on, 
and backlit as a slide, you really can't see the crack that runs down here at all. This crack is almost completely disguised by the backlighting. Uh, if you're looking for it, you can see a difference in the color here that is the difference between the slightly bluish tinge where there is glass and the lack of the bluish tinge where there is no glass. But this whole corner is missing glass. Which I just think it's really neat. I'm... Apparently I get excited and interested in silly things. Uh, the back also has a crack that I didn't even notice from the front. Okay, these are kind of cool. Am I the only, like, I can't be the only one that thinks they're kind of cool. It's just, I know slideshows can be boring. <laughs> Boy, do I know slideshows can be boring. Um, but for some reason, this is kind of cool. Looking at these slides, um, both to look at the subject of the slides, but also the makeup of the slides and how they're physically put together. This one, um, not really visible without the backlighting. Um, why are you saying that while you're preparing a PowerPoint for this afternoon's class? Why? Oh, I'm sorry, Lord Portico. Uh, but if you've ever been in an art history class and looked at an art history slideshow during a lecture, it can be really boring. <laughs> so for me, being able to look at a slide and learn something um, from each slide and being able to engage in, with them in this way, they're less boring for me. As someone who loves looking at old pictures, these are fun. So this is, uh, again, Etruscan. This is a capital, or capus, and molding. Uh, so this would be the top of a column. Uh, that if this were an architectural history class or an art history class, the professor would be able to tell you what specifically about this capital makes it Etruscan. I cannot, without referencing the internet, to find out. Uh, I'm searching for Etruscan columns characteristics. Let's see what we find out. Uh, Etruscan architecture forms, materials, construction, and influences. Let's see what this has. Um, oh, this has paywalled content that I will not be looking at, apparently, because it's paywalled. Um, yeah, uh, thanks. Nope, uh, that is also paywalled. Um, the first two hits were paywalled. Uh, all right, Wikipedia. Etruscan architecture was created around 900 BC and 27 BC, uh, when the expanding civilization of ancient Rome finally absorbed. Okay, so be between about, sorry, 900 to 27 BC, um, I don't know if this is going to give me what I need. The ladies at the top. Uh, 
The main monumental forms of Etruscan architecture listed a decreasing order of the surviving remains were the houses of the wealthy elite, the mysterious monumental complexes, temples, city walls, and rock-cut tombs. Apart from the podia of temples and some house foundations, only the walls and rock-cut tombs were mainly in stone and have therefore often largely survived. Um... looking to see yeah that article doesn't really tell me but quite possibly I, d I don't know I don't know what specifically about this column capital um, identifies it as Etruscan in origin that I would be curious to to learn but I'm not going to spend uh, more time trying to discover that right now on stream because we have plenty of other stuff to look at. Um, let's see. Uh, tombs. Uh, house plans. Porta di Gioli. Temple drawing. We're going to move on from the Etruscans and look at France. I don't know why I said it that way. France. We're going to look at France. Uh, yeah, okay, that was... At the time when I was saying, hey, I'm going to mark where I pulled things out of by putting post-it notes. I had already lost where I pulled something out of. I just found it again. But... Our first item from France is a slide made by the Chicago Slide Company. 6 East Lake Street, Chicago. I doubt that they're still making glass slides today, but uh, we have a lovely glass slide here of a kale, a, uh, A prey of church. Is word I do not know. Um. <clears throat> e. C. So, ekayo. Dekayo. Hmm. I'm going to figure out what this is. Uh, uh. E C A Y E U X E C A Y E U X Nope. No idea. Even the, the internet's uh, corrective spelling algorithms are not helping me here. Oh! Wait, wait, no. E C A. Y. E U X. It's E C O Y E U X. E C O Y O. A commune in the uh, Carente Maritime Department in southwestern France. Ecoyo. Uh, all right, so that is the location. I'm just going to correct with my lovely little pencil here to indicate that that is an O, not an A. Ekoyo, uh, and we have uh, E-C-O-Y-E-U-X-A-P-R-C. Let's 
see what we find. That just didn't work. Uh, uh, why? I'm trying to find out if there is a famous church in Ecoyo. Um, Eglise Saint Vivien de Coyo, church in Ecoyo. Seems like this could be it. The Eglise Saint Vivienne de Coyo. Huh. I can't find a whole lot of information about it, but it seems to possibly be the right one. Um Sure. It's a church in France. Uh, I'm sure they wanted to point out something in particular about the architectural design here, but not being the um, professor who was teaching arch architectural history uh, and therefore compiled these slides, I don't know what. Uh, let's see. We have another cracked slide here. I'll start with the light off. Um, and you can see the two cracks, uh, one here and one across here. This appears to be a tail or a fireplace from a building. Uh, let's light that up there. This says uh, Hotel de Cluny. According to hmm. <clears throat> uh, so according to Wikipedia, you're just thinking how how you'd climb that. Oh, this because uh, <laughs> you played too much Assassin's Creed. Since the column slide wasn't in color, it could have been that the top was e either painted or terracotta, but both would have been in line with the Etruscan style architecture per a design website you found. Cool. I think that's more. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't know. I thought that the knowledge that they were brightly colored was more recent knowledge than I think these slides are. But I don't know for certain when these slides are from. So, and I don't know exactly when we discovered. I know ancient, like Greek statuary, we now know was brightly painted. Um, all right, so this is the Musée de Cluny, Cluny Museum, also known as Musée National uh, du Moyen Age or Termes et Hotel de Cluny, uh, National Museum of the Middle Ages, uh, Cluny Thermal Baths and Mansion, uh, Museum of the Middle Ages in Paris, France. Located in the Latin Quarter of the 5th Arrondissement of Paris in 6 Place Paul Ponleve, uh, next to the square Samuel Pate, south of the Boulevard Saint-Germain, uh, between the Boulevard Saint-Michel and the Rue Saint-Jacques. Uh, 
so partially constructed on the remnants of the third century Gallo-Roman baths known as the Termes de Cluny, thermal baths from the Roman era of Gaul. Uh, Gaul being what the Romans called France. Um, so a lot of like just stonework detail kind of neat how well the slides hold together even when they're cracked. I, I'm finding that to be neat. I didn't know that so many of these were were cracked, um, but it doesn't seem to really affect their usefulness at all. Okay, this is interesting. I'm gonna show you it backwards first. It's a map. Uh, floor plan, it looks like. Uh, House of Jacques Coeur. Who is Jacques Coeur? Q-U-E-S-C-O-E-U-R. Um, born in 1395 in Bourget, uh, died in 1456 in Chois, was a French government official and state-sponsored merchant whose personal fortune became legendary and led to his eventual disgrace. He initiated regular trade routes between France and the Levant. Uh, his memory retains iconic status in Bourget, uh, where he built a palatial house that is preserved to this day. So this would be a map of that house. Uh, <clears throat> what I found unique and interesting about this slide, and the reason I showed it to you backwards first, is that if I flip it over and show you the front of it, it's got all of this, like, the lines and whorls and stuff around, which if this was part of a uh, lantern show or being shown by the lantern, you would not see. Because that would just project the, the clear part onto the wall. But for me, I thought it was kind of neat, the um, sort of semi-graph paper border on the front side of it. Um, which has, again, nothing to do with the content of the slide, which is a floor plan of this famous house in Bourget. Um, I do not have the key uh, to know what the letters are identifying. I assume it's saying what those different rooms are, but I don't have the key that tells me what that, uh, uh, what the rooms are. All right, one more from France, and then we'll move on to, I think Germany is next alphabetically in, in what's in this collection. Um, <clears throat> this would be the Church of the Val de Grasse. A very, very Baroque church. I think it would be Baroque. It's very overdone. Lots of, I don't know that overdone is what I even wanted to say there. It's, it's just got a lot of detail, a lot of just more and more and more and more, just lots of stuff on it. Um, Val de Grasse. Let's see what the, the, the actual description by people who know these things uh, says about what style it is. Was, uh, the Church of the Val de Grasse is a Roman Catholic church of the, in the 5th arrondissement 
of Paris in what is now the Val de Grasse Hospital. The edifice was formerly a royal abbey and its dome is a principal landmark of the skyline of Paris. It was originally designed by Francois Mansart, uh, succeeded by uh, Jacques Le Mercier, who designed the Saint Sacrement uh, Chapel's um, spiral coffered dome after Philbert de Lorme, uh, uh, Philbert de Lorme's chapel at the Chateau d'Arnay. You've, you've been there in some games? That's cool. Uh, founded by Anne of Austria, queen consort of Louis the Eight, or 13th in 1621. Uh, construction began in 1634. Uh, the cupola, which sort of what we see here. I, I'm just seeing if it'll name an art style. is the problem with doing stuff like this. I want to know, because I did spend a little bit of time very interested in art, in art history and architectural history. And yes, con confirmation. Like, I looked at this and I said Baroque. And it is Baroque architecture. <laughs> the problem with me, uh, like, I looked at it, I said, oh, this is very Baroque. And then I was like, but what if I'm wrong? I should double check since I did not check ahead of time. And I should confirm that this is actually Baroque and not like some related architectural style that I've never heard of. Uh, but no, according to the internet, this is indeed Baroque. <laughs> we strive for accuracy, if not timeliness. Um, okay, let's see. Let's see what do we have next. Also, if there is a country that is listed in the um, finding aid that you want me to make sure I get to, let me know, and I will make sure that we get to it. Uh, hey, let's see. Did I? No, I didn't. Okay, we're good, we're good, we're good. I'm muttering to myself now as I pull a few things from Germany. Just a couple. And a couple of things here from Greece. I don't know what, but we're going to pull something. And I'm just going to pull the rest out of here. Uh, the, the more things from this box while you all are waiting. Ooh, yes. Italy. I think we're just going to pull that one from Italy because I want to make sure we get some things out of the second box as well. Oh, yes, thank you for sharing the finding it again, Portico. I think this is my favorite of the background music songs that um, Pretzel plays when I put it on uh, chill jazz. <clears throat> Let's see, after Italy. Oh. <laughs> yeah, we'll pull that one. I don't know. I'm just pulling random things now. Because I need to make sure that I get as much as I can. Ooh. Um, yeah. We'll do that one. <gasps> we're going we're gonna to do lightning round. 
here in a sec. I'm, I'm showing you. I'm pulling multiple things. Uh, that one. So have people traveled and seen like historic sites in Europe? Uh, most of these are Europe. I honestly have not, but I'm curious if any of you have. Unknown location. <laughs> you know I'm gonna pull that one that says unknown location. Only in video games. I'm guessing a lot of them have been um, the Assassin's Creed video games, which are extensively researched and as realistically recreated as possible given the graphical technology available at the time that the games were created so accurate that uh, when the um, uh, when Notre Dame burned they went to Assassin's Creed, to the people who made the video game, to get detailed information about what had burned. Because it was some of the most accurate documentation of what had been in Notre Dame before the fire. Um, so, Exploring these places in video games does not mean that you're getting a subpar experience. <laughs> you're getting, if it's Assassin's Creed at least, you're getting a very exceptionally detailed, accurate depiction. You saw a bone church while visiting the Czech Republic once. I don't know what a bone church is, um, I would be curious if you wish to explain. Um, made in Germany. Uh, this slide made by uh, Sisteren uh, Lichtbilder in Leipzig, apparently. An ossuary. Hi, Triamis. Oh, a church made of bones. Literally. I am not aware of these, but okay. I am now looking. Interesting. That's really neat. I I guess I I've seen them. I did not know that they were like a real actual like I thought they were just for movies. Uh, let's see. This, I'm, I'm going to actually look at the slides because they're in front of me, but now I'm very curious to learn more about ossuaries. But This is the um, <coughs> Regensburg Cathedral in Germany. Very common, like, you expect to, this is what you think of when you think of a European cathedral. It is this style of architecture. You've got the churchyard out front. You've got the <laughs> yeah. This is this is it. You've been to one in in Czech and one in Portugal. Yeah, I didn't know they were real things. This is why the stream is marked educational. Not just because it's educational for you. Uh, most of the time, it's educational for me. I learned something. Wait, St. Peter's Church? Time to the top. Climb to the top and jump off Assassin's Creed style. Somehow, I think you would probably die in that case. But, um, this one is in Utrecht. It's labeled as Germany. Um, 
which confuses me. Because Utrecht is in the Netherlands. <laughs> Uh, unless there's a, a Utrecht in Germany that I'm not aware of, which totally is possible. During the Black Death, they ran out of places to bury people and had to come up with alternative ways. A history teacher in college played Assassin's Creed games after doing a bit on the time era of the games. That's cool, Shadows. <laughs> Sometimes it's not a good idea in the video game either. Uh, Kutnahora is the one that you had seen. Okay. I'm. Okay, so this is St. Mary's Church. Uh. I'm so confused. Yeah, no, I. Like, it is labeled as. Germany. But this is in the Netherlands. Because this is and and on the slide itself it says German. You tracked St. Mary's. But this is in the Netherlands, because you tracked is in the Netherlands. Ludan. Yeah, that was my brain was like, wait a minute, this is in the Netherlands, not Germany. Um, and indeed, it is in the Netherlands. This is St. Mary's Church, uh, which I've been to. I have been there. <laughs> we finally hit one that I have been to. Um, arches, the, the detail arches. This is architectural uh, instructional slides, so it makes sense. Um, but yeah, let's talk about geography here. Utrecht is not in Germany. Uh, like I said, lightning round, because um, we are approaching the end of time for today. But uh, I wanted to get a sample of some of the other things in here. Greece, can you guess what we're gonna look at from Greece? What possible interesting thing architecturally would we have to look at from Greece? <laughs> Possibly gods? So the Acropolis, good, good guess. Not actually what we're looking at. And turns out it was a trick question anyway. Because much like the last one was labeled as being in Germany when it was really in the Netherlands, this one is labeled as being in Greece when it's actually in Italy. This is the Temple of Concord. Or Temple of Concordia, Agrigento, uh, which is not in Greece. Well, but, okay, so, it makes sense that it was labeled as Greece only because it is a Greek temple. It's just, it's in Sicily, uh, which is part of Italy. So this was part of the Greek architectural lecture. So it says Greek, uh, but then it lets you know this is the um, 
Agrigentum, uh, Temple of Concord. So, it is Greek, but these appear to have been arranged in the boxes geographically in alphabetical order, in which case this should actually be listed as Italy, not Greece. So who knows, you were thinking of the Parthenon. Uh, there indeed is a slide for the Parthenon. I did not pull it, mostly because it's super well known and we would have seen it before, probably. Um, this one, I don't know. I can't make out what the title is on the slide. Uh, it is also Greek architecture. It's another Greek style temple. The envelope it's in just says Greece question <laughs> mark. Um, and it's got some writing uh, looks like maybe an R, a G, A, H, A, something, um, P, R, I, N, quite possibly. I, I don't know, though. It's really hard to make out the, the script, and I probably would need a magnifying glass uh, and some really good lighting to try and make out what the letter forms are, to try and piece out what letters these are in the description so that I could then do some searching to figure out exactly what this is. Or I could do a reverse image search and possibly get it from that. Although I imagine a reverse image search on this is gonna return something like the Acropolis. Uh, or some other Greek temple that, uh, Anyway, this slide made in Germany. All right. Since we've already looked at some Italian stuff, how about more Italian stuff? The Temple of Jupiter at Girgenti. The Temple of Jupiter. Which, I guess, an architectural blueprint of the Temple of Jupiter really just looks like a banquet table with a bunch of chairs around it. <laughs> there's not much to it. There's a bunch of exterior columns and a row of interior columns. And yeah, that's the Temple of Jupiter. It does appear there are two entrances, one here and one here. And then this appears to be like the raised dais. Uh, I believe there's a statue of Jupiter at the end there in the center. It does have the platform on the left where the statue would go, yes. So this is, this is the platform where the statue goes and these are the two doors that you can enter. But it's a really simple architectural <laughs> where the statute would go, uh, Portico, I think it's understandable that your autocorrect may have switched statue to statute. Some round and some not round. Uh, yeah, so the exterior columns of the Temple of Jupiter are rounded columns, uh, but on the inside, everything is uh, square. <laughs> statute is a codified law. Uh, a statue is a piece of rock. Not just rock, but yeah, I, I get what you mean. Um, another one that has red tape on the outside of it. Uh, does anybody know what that is? I haven't looked yet, so I can't tell you. Also, do you see the crack? There is crack. A crack in, in this slide. Um, this one says Italy, 
Byzantine, uh, we have the crack that runs down the, the glass here. So this is Byzantine Italian architecture. Um, look like something from Italy. Yep. Uh, this is from Ravenna. It is uh, S. Vitali. V I T A L I. Uh, I'm looking to see what I can find out information-wise. The Basilica of San Vitale. Yeah, that's it. The Basilica of San Vitale, uh, a late antique church in Ravenna, Italy. Sixth century church is an important surviving example of early Christian Byzantine art and architecture one of eight structures in Ravenna inscribed on the UNESCO World Heritage List. Cool. This one, it is black and white, but you can almost see green over here, like the, where you've got the deep plants. It almost looks green. It is just black and white, though. All right, <clears throat> where are we going next? Totally not planning how to climb the building. All right, where are we? There's an easy answer that would be correct. We're in the Holy Sepulcher, or Sepulcher. Um, this is uh, Jerusalem, Church of the Holy Sepulcher after Crusades. I don't actually know how to say that word, and I never realized I didn't actually know how to say that word until I tried to say it on stream. I think it's Sepulcher. But I don't think I've ever actually tried to say it out loud before. <laughs> um, all right, let's see. I, the floor plans are, eh, they're okay. I prefer the exterior or the detail shots or the actual like architecture shots. Um, let's move on from the Church of the Holy Sepulchre's floor plan to some ruins. Uh, these are Roman ruins. But do you know where they are? If you can see the text on the label, you'll know this is the Temple of Bacchus. Interior uh, showing doorway. Looks like Greece or Italy. Uh, this is actually in Baalbek, Lebanon. Which I guess I didn't know that there were um, Roman ruins in Lebanon, but mostly because I never thought about it. Because of course there would be Roman ruins in Lebanon. Uh, Given its location and the extent of the Roman Empire, it must have been a hell of a party. But it just never was never really something that I thought of. But yeah, it totally makes sense. Uh, and it's the Temple of Bacchus. 
Um, so Lebanon is um, just to the northeast of Egypt. So it is, it is right across like the Suez Canal from Egypt. But like all of the Roman Empire encompassed like that entire coastline of, of the Mediterranean. So it makes sense that ruins like this would be there. It's just not something I had ever thought of, mostly because that was not a region of the world that we thought a lot about in American schools when I was growing up. I even took Latin, but my Latin textbooks went westward into Gaul and into, uh, into Britain. Um, All right, so this is another one that is not a region that we spent a lot of time on in my school education, uh, but this is some mon stone monuments from Persepolis um, in Persia, modern day Iran. So they've got a good, like, wide-ranging architectural detail. What's, what's missing from this collection, which does not surprise me, or, well, there's, uh, you learned a lot of geography in Sunday school, and Sunday, that is, that makes sense, honestly. Um, you're getting a good sort of, indication of the geographic area that is encompassed by this collection. This is a standard geographical area for, like this is what I would expect in an art history uh, or architectural history course. It's a lot of Europe, some Middle East, Mediterranean. What's missing? Uh, I see an obvious, or a couple of obvious omissions that should be part of this slide deck that are not. Uh, I'm curious if you see them as well. <clears throat> so this, because if this is world, world architecture, we're missing some things. Uh, Oviedo, Santa Maria, uh, Santa Maria de Narco Nave. This is a church in Spain. <clears throat> Naranco. In Oviedo, Spain. Santa Maria de Naranco. It's the nave. <laughs> of course it's the nave. That's a part of a church, not part of the name of the building. Exactly shadows. There is nothing in this collection, as far as I can tell, from any part of Asia, whether that be Russia or into China, Japan, India, uh, none of that. Nothing in Mongolia, no, no, no Asia. <clears throat> uh, no Australia, I don't know that there would be. I don't personally know enough about architectural history in Australia to know if there was, uh, if there were earthworks or anything like that by Australian Aboriginals or Aborigines. Um, <clears throat> if there is, I'd say that we're seriously lacking in education about it because I took art history <laughs> and focused on uh, 
uh, I, I even took a course specifically in Oceania um, and the South Pacific cultures and uh, Africa and Oceania um, and never was introduced to any Australian Aboriginal sort of earthworks or architectural things. Um, this one, unknown location, church slash monastery. Um, so if there was, but also no South American. There are definitely uh, Mayan and Aztec architectural influences, no North American, no Central American. Um, that should be there uh, if you're studying the world as far as architecture goes. So this is an exterior shot of a church or monastery. There appears to be a person. Is that a person? I need to zoom in further. I don't know if that's a person. Do you all see it in the picture? I think that's a person right there. And they appear to be wearing a bowler hat and they have a long beard and they've got a trench coat on. They've, they're leaning against the column. They've got one, their left foot behind their right foot uh, and, and toe touching the ground. Um, trench coat, can't really tell, possibly a white button up shirt, but they've definitely got a beard, a full beard, and they're wearing what looks to be a bowler hat. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, they do have a cane. So given the shape of the hat, that would give us an appropriate or approximate date range of when this photo would have been taken, uh, or at least could not have been taken before the invention of the bowler hat. Uh, <laughs> that's the Cathedral of uh, Cephalu, Cephalu, Sicily. And you found it with a Google image search. Amazing. Absolutely amazing, Triamis. Uh, I'm just going to jot that down here on the envelope for any future researchers since this says unknown location. And uh, Cathedral of And I can do this because I am an archivist who actually works here. Uh, if a researcher was to identify it, we'd ask them to tell us and we would update it. Oh no, Moobot. <laughs> Thank you for uh, trying to post a link, Triamis. Um, I'm gonna, I am running out of time. I have two more slides and then we're gonna call it. I wanted to glance at one of the Gaudet. Um, I have access to the chat and I can free it up and, and like, I can copy and paste that URL. Um, share the message. Uh, copy, paste, and we'll just throw that over here as well. All right, there we go. So this one, there was that whole series that are just labeled Gaudet, G-A, G-U-A-D-E-T, -G and then a number. 
My guess is that these are images from a textbook. But I don't know. But that would be my guess as to what this series is. I've got one more of them that I pulled. Because uh, this is like architectural pattern detail. Um, and if I, I'm just gonna, this is really tiny text, so. Examples, diverse examples of sections of pillars of the modern age. So these are the, the shapes of what pillars would, like possible pillars of the modern age uh, are. And then, and, and these appear to be really moisture damaged slides. Like, I don't know, they're, they look like they've, they're really dusty and dirty and not well maintained. <laughs> the, the Godet ones. Um, this is another one um, from that series. And just a tiny little bit of, and you can see there's, Clearly, it's not in perfect condition. Uh, it's even like hard to see the detail of the image itself because of the, the weathering of the glass. Um, if I shut off the light, you'll be able to see there's a bit of like, you can see dried residue that even not backlit, it's kind of hard to see the illustration on this slide. Anyway, that is, that's where I'm going to end it with the, the, as far as the slides. Um, I hope you all had a fun time looking at random architectural slides with me today. Uh, this Glass Lantern slide collection is, it's interesting, it's neat, uh, it's, I, I don't know, I, Oh, whoops, I thought I had switched to, um, yeah. I thought I had switched scenes, but I hadn't. Um, I think it's fun. I think it's interesting. It's just random collection. We don't even know exactly why we have it, but clearly it was an instructional collection. This was like the slides that an instructor would have used to show and then teach about architectural detail. Um, appears to be primarily uh, Europe, in the modern classical period, uh, or modern and classical periods, but a little bit of the ancient world, uh, meaning in artistic speech of European-derived um, countries, the ancient world refers to the ancient world around the Mediterranean. Uh, so it's, it's that. Um, you learn more about early photography than you expected. Um, I think the glass slides and, and like learning a little bit about the composition of them, seeing how well they stood up to cracking, um, it was really moisture that seemed to be the big problem for the slides that caused more of an issue than uh, like dropping them and having cracks in them didn't seem to be a big problem. Even losing a piece of part of the glass on one side wasn't a huge issue. Uh, so really, despite, oh, <laughs> you like the bird pin? Thank you, Hannah. Uh, despite the um, fragility of glass, these are remarkably sturdy, it seems like. Um, all right, so this is gonna be where we're gonna end today's. Like Eddie Izzard said, I grew up in Europe, where the history comes from, yeah. Um, yeah, so that's where we're going to leave off with today's archival adventure. That's the last thing that we're going to look at from that. Uh, what we have coming up next week is my second attempt, or, well, third, I guess, technically, attempt at an actual architecture collection. 
so next week, um, we are going to look at the Vera Jansoni, or Jansone, I don't know exactly how to pronounce this name, Vera Jansone Architectural Collection. It has a lot of big architectural drawings again. Um, I've learned from last time. I know to bring something so that the table surface does not show through onion skin. Uh, so we're going to try that out and um, see what we find. I don't remember anything about the collection other than that it is one of the more used, uh, more popular architecture ones that we have. Uh, and then coming up on the 26th, I have uh, fantasy slash horror uh, pulp magazine that we're going to look at. Uh, and then on the 2nd of November, I've got some papers related to the Monacan Indian Nation, whose name you've heard if you've been here at the top of this stream, because they're part of the land and labor acknowledgement. Um, yeah, so I've, I've still got things planned out uh, just every week, except for two of them um, as we proceed through the rest of the year. Uh, so... Yeah, let's go ahead and figure out a raid. Um, look and see who is around to say hello to and pop in on today. Okay. I basically have two places that I have tended to raid. Uh, do we want aquarium or video games? I'll let you all pick. Sharks at the aquarium or some video game fun? Video games. Absolutely. If we're good for that, we're good for that. We're gonna we're gonna raid over to Stephen Joyce, um, who excellent, wonderful uh, streamer, wonderful community, many many librarians in that community uh, that watch Stephen Joyce. Um, he is currently playing a game called Coral Island. Uh, and so we're going to pop in over there and say hello. Uh, thank you all so much for joining me today for this archival adventure. I hope it was a relaxing and educational and interesting time. And hopefully I see you again soon. Um, until I do, I hope that you stay curious and keep exploring history. Bye.